are the nations in an uproar, and the people devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us tear apart our fetters and cast away their cords from us. Ha! But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning and we learn about government and we learn about your plans and your purposes in that, that, Father, you would instill upon our hearts the, the peace that comes with knowing that you are in control, that, Father, we need to rest in you, to rest in your son Jesus, and that, Father, we just walk according to your ways. And we listen to you. Speak upon our hearts today, Father. Let us rejoice in the fact that we have a Savior that has forgiven us, that is our leader. And we give your name the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Norm, uh, before we dive into the word, I want you to just, with your neighbor, real quick, answer this question. What good is government? Turn to someone next to you and, you know, what good is government? Just for a minute, just carry on a little conversation. What, what do you think of when you hear the word government? What comes to mind, good or bad, positive or negative? What good is government? Don't be afraid to mix it up. Gina, Katusha. What do you guys think right here? What comes to mind when you think of government? All right, I see too many, there's too many smiles out there. We're talking about government, and you guys are smiling about this. You guys aren't talking about it, are you? You're not answering the question. All right, real quick, what, what do you think? What, what was shared in your group? Bring it on in. What comes to mind? What do you think? Corruption. Need we say more? All right, let's pray. No, uh, what else? All right, God put government in place for us. Okay, okay, good. A little more optimistic. I like it. Okay, we have order instead of anarchy. I like that. What else? Keepers of peace. Okay. Well, you guys are actually really good. I like this. It's not a lot of negativity. There's some positivity. What else? Anyone else? Government. What, what was discussed in your, your little powwow? Limited. I like it. No, you didn't. All right, I like it. What else? Authority. Okay. So when you know we talk about government, one more, Greg. Physical protection. I like it. Yeah. You know when we talk about government, it's it's one of those topics that sometimes may cause us to cringe. And you know if you grew up in an environment like me, there were two things you never talked about. You never talked about religion or politics. I grew up in that in my home uh, like that because. You know, those were the two topics that just rocked the boat. Those were the two topics that you could get really nasty with your, your fr family and friends. And uh, 
but yet the Bible talks about government. Norm just read Psalm 2. Write that Psalm down and read it this week because it talks about how, how government uh, can be an imposter. It, it perceives to, to have more power than it actually has. And, and yet God is the one who says, I've ordained government. And, and in, in the end, what does that passage say in Psalm 2? I love that. Kiss the sun. Pay homage to the sun and realize that you and all of us are ultimately dependent upon him, uh, which is pretty awesome. I, I got a chance this week to hang out with the, uh, the highway patrol of, of Arizona. Uh, by hanging out, I mean I got pulled over on the U.S. 60. Am I not allowed to confess? Uh, this is confession time for Pastor Scott. So I, I just want you to know, this is, okay, so I went out to East Mesa to visit somebody in the hospital, part of our, our church family that was suffering uh, from kidney failure. So I went out there and just visited and prayed with this woman. And then I got in my car and I'm driving down the US 60. And I don't necessarily slum it over there, but I'm, I'm over in East Mesa. And, uh, and I'm, I, I decided to call Jerry Cornelius. I was just like, I want to check on Jerry, see how she's doing. So I, I got Jerry and she's up, up in the mountains and we're talking. And, and I'm driving and I've got like the Bluetooth thing on the car. So I'm hands, you know, hands free device, totally safe, got my seatbelt on. Um, all of a sudden, I look behind me, and the, the, the red and blue lights are flashing. And I go, Jerry, I have to call you back. I'm getting pulled over by the highway patrol. She laughed and hung up. So I pull over, and I was just totally honest. I just said, I'm, you know, not often I play the pastor card, because not often I get pulled over, all right? So, but I, I said, uh, I said, officer, it, I, I was distracted, and I was going over the speed limit. And what I didn't know, it was the safety enforcement zone. I hate those. Because you got to be like right there, 65, not one little. But I was doing 80 and um, not paying attention. I was, being, I was being a loving, compassionate pastor. I was like, I, and I told, the, I told the highway truck, I said, I'm a pastor. And literally, I was on the phone with someone who had just lost her husband uh, several weeks ago. The story is good. Like, he didn't shed any tears, but he's like, he goes, you know why I pulled it? I said, yeah, I was speeding. And he went back to his car, and he gave me a warning, and I have the warning right here. Um, and I've got his name. I'm thinking about finding him on Facebook and just saying, hey, buddy, thank you so much. Uh, but you know what? I, I confessed. I told him what I was guilty of. I wasn't trying to hide it. I wasn't trying to run from it. Um, that there's a safety enforcement zone, and those are the areas that they're really, really watching. And I just said, yeah, I'm guilty. And I just said I was distracted. And he came back, gave me a warning, and, and I was reading the ticket, which, you know, most of you would probably just throw it away and be like, yes, I got off, right? And I, I'm reading this, and there's a note on here, and it says this. Um, this is issued to you as a courtesy and to remind you to do your part in promoting safety on our highways by closely observing our traffic laws. And um, I told him, I said, there's a reason why the speed limit's there. And I said, I, I acknowledge that. Because if there was no speed limit posted and there was no law to obey, we would probably have just the messiest of car accidents and crashes and casualties and stuff that we wouldn't want to deal with. We're thankful there are laws. We're thankful that there's a speed limit. And a warning is to remind us the importance of heeding those, wall, uh, those laws. Amen? And so... We bring that same mentality to the scriptures and, and we're reminded that the Bible doesn't just talk about Jesus. The Bible just doesn't talk about salvation. The Bible just doesn't talk about how we're to treat our spouse or raise our children. One of the topics the Bible talks about is government. And most of us are negligent in understanding what the Bible says about government. And it is one of the institutions given to us by God. However imperfect it is, it is still in Scripture. So you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. Turn to Genesis chapter 9. And also I want you to hold a, a finger in Romans chapter 13. These are the two really important texts in the Scripture regarding government. But, but, the, the, but the, 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 the theology of government is found throughout Scripture. And I'm going to cite several examples for you. So take out your outline and, and a pencil or a pen or your smartphone or tablet, however you're going to take notes, because this is really going to be kind of like Civics 101 this morning. And, uh, and Donna and I were talking about that 
uh, this morning. She's involved with Center for Arizona Policy, and she's been with them for a while, and I appreciate her presence there. And she's also brought voter guides. So we have a, an important vote, uh, election coming up in a couple weeks. You still have time to get in on that. They're on the table on your way out. So make sure you do your due diligence as a citizen and, and exercise your right to vote. Uh, also, we were talking about the importance of just understanding basic civics, and she's thinking about maybe doing a small uh, group here in a couple months, which would be really, really good uh, with uh, Donna and her experience with CAP. So um, Genesis 9 is where we're going to be. So this morning, we're going to look at the foundation for human government. And, and again, we live in a context where, you know, it's USA, USA, and we're going to make America great again, or we're going to fake America great again, or however you want to say it. And I, and I want you to know that it is one thing to, to be patriotic, but there's another thing where I think you can use your patriotism as a religion, and it's a false religion. Can I be clear on this with us all? That we have lost sight, especially as evangelicals, that our citizenship is not with this country. Amen? Our citizenship, the Bible says, Philippians chapter 3, is in heaven. Boy, but there's a world out there that doesn't believe in Jesus, and they would think our, our, our evangelical presence is all about setting up our kingdom here. And that is, that is a false, false theology. You know, we pray for our president. We pray for our elected officials. We do our best as, as living as good citizens in our country. But may we never forget that our citizenship is not here ultimately. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we serve a king greater than any earthly king. Amen? We serve a president greater than any earthly president. Amen? And his name is President Jesus. You guys don't know about President Jesus, do you? He is awesome. So, uh, but yet... We, we talk about politics, and I know, you know, some people get all, like, miffed and upset about it. And, you know, especially when you're talking to people who may not be a, associated with a church or have any relationship with Jesus. You know, one of the things you hear uh, commonly stated is, there's got to be a separation between church and state. You, you ever heard that phrase? What you need to know is not in any founding document in this country. You need to know that was a phrase just, just kind of whimsically mentioned by Thomas Jefferson, who basically said it in context saying, there shall be no state-run church. That's the topic, that there is not going to be a state-run church because all of our ancestors that came over here from Europe basically said, we know what it's like to live in, a, in an environment where there's a state-run church and it's not good. So we're going to start something new here where there will be the freedom of religion. There will be the freedom to worship. And there will not be a state-run religion. Why? Because the founding fathers understood that the state does what the state does, and the church does what the church does, and they're to work together, but neither is to assume the other's role. And so we need to understand that we need to get back to basics, because there will be people saying, isn't separation of church and state in the Bible? No. Or I joke with them and say, separation of church and state, yeah, second hesitation is chapter 11. Turn there and find it in your Bibles if you would. Um, so this doesn't mean that God's not involved in our politics because if we affirm scripture, we see that God has given us really three institutions. He's given us marriage. He's given us the church. He's given us government. However, imperfectly those institutions may be, they are given to us by God. So both state and church are ordained by God, yet there's biblical separation between these two entities. No government is perfect. Amen? No government is perfect, and some are better than others. And if you want to write this down, there are some governments that are servants, and they follow Romans 13 that we're going to look at here in a bit. And some governments are imposters, Psalm chapter 2, like uh, Norm read this morning. So both are important. All believers are called to submit to government, whether they like what the government's doing or not. And we'll talk about more about what our submission looks like. But look at Genesis 9, verses 1 through 7. Turn your Bibles there. And it says this in verse 1. So you remember the context. Noah and his family have just parked the ark. Yeah, I like that. Parked the ark. They parked the ark after the major worldwide flood. And the first thing they do once they get off the ark, based on God's command for them to get off, they build an altar and they worship God. Then look what happens in verse nine, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. 
very reminiscent of what God had commanded Adam and Eve to do after he had created the world. Verse 2, and the fear of you and the terror of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave you the green plant. And only you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So now there's this interesting discussion that God is saying to, to Noah and his family that there's going to be some dietary changes. The animal world's going to look differently. You're going to respond to it differently. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. And then verse 5, surely I will require. Now notice in verse 5 how many times God says, I will require. I demand, literally. And surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require it. And from every man and every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And then verse 7, and as for you, be fruitful, multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply on it or in it. May God bless the reading of his word. So some interesting verses here that we need to tackle. Uh, the main emphasis I want to talk about this morning is really verses 5 and 6, which is the foundation for human government, which ties into Romans 13. But let's just get a couple other notes out of the way first. In, in your notes, there's three, blank, uh, three major points. The first is this, the propagation of life. Verse 1, and then verse 7. So it kind of bookends this section. God says to Noah, it's time to get busy and have babies. Make babies, have babies, let's repopulate the earth. Again, what you have is this imagery that's very familiar with us from the first couple chapters of Genesis. God creates out of chaos. Well, now here after the flood, he's recreating after chaos, the chaos being the flood, and God is going to start brand new with Noah and his family. And he says to them, populate the earth. Basically, there's this idea here that you are to respect life and the life-giving process and multiply. If you're if you're, a, if you're if you're able to have children, have children. If if you're able to have multiple children, have multiple children. And so God says, populate the earth. And this has been commanded by God from the beginning. We need to understand how much God values reproduction. We need to understand how God values little children. They are a blessing from the Lord. And so one of the things we see right at the outset of not only this passage, but from the beginning of Genesis, is how much God says, men, women, marriage, family, having babies is important. And none of us would disagree with that. And yet I just read about a group up in Portland, Oregon. A lot of crazy groups in Portland, if you guys haven't figured this out yet. There's this group that's meeting now where basically their motto is the extinction of the human race. Uh, they exist basically to say that the, the sooner the human race is extinct and goes out of existence, the better off we are. So obviously they're not for Genesis chapter 9 verse 1. So, uh, but this is clearly anti-biblical mentality. God wants us, has created us with the ability to reproduce. And this is why from the beginning we espouse, we celebrate marriage between be, being one man with one woman forever. And then if they're able to have children and populate the earth, this is God's command. Second point is this, the provision of life. Some of you are going, wow, point one just went by really fast. Don't get so comfortable, all right? Point three is where we're going to hang out for most of our morning. But prop, the, number two, the provision of life, verses two, three, and four. So now we have this discussion about animals and humans' re a relationship to the animal world. Now, before the flood, and at the very beginning, there was this idea of harmony that existed between Adam, Eve, and, and, the, and the creation of animals. Even so much so that Adam was given the responsibility to name the animals, Genesis chapter 2, which implied that he is superior to the animals, he has dominion over the animals, and that humans are distinct from the, the animal world. We are a creature altogether different than animals. Amen? 
We are different than ostriches. We are different than elephants. We are different than the manatees. I love the manatees. You guys know that. But uh, that's another story for another time. But we are different from the animals. But now after the flood, the relationship between man and the animals is going to be different. And, and I wonder if before the flood, because there was so much violence between human beings, remember God in Genesis 6 says, that there is violence and there's wickedness and there's evil and people are just killing each other. I wonder if that affected the animal world and they started also getting more vicious and they started to attack more. And here we are after the flood, Noah and his family and all the animals are released, but God says your relationship to the animals is going to be different. Why? Look at verse 2. And the fear of you and the terror of you will be upon every beast. They are going to be afraid of you. And this is why Many animals in the world, when there's the presence of humans, run. They flee. They don't want to be near us. And this is evidence of sin and wickedness and evil, that they don't want to be in the same place where you and I are at. And so there's a respect there that God has hardwired in the animals saying that we are different. Even they would, in their own animal way, instinctually see us as a different creature and they fear us. And so there's this change in the animal world, and and perhaps because of the violence that existed among men. And and we've all seen movies like Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds. I'm glad we don't live in a context like The Birds, right? If you've never seen Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, or maybe uh, something more recent, The Ghosts in the Darkness, the the story of the man-eating lions of, of, of Africa. You guys hear about that? These these lions would come out in the middle of the night and just drag you from your tent and eat you up. And definitely not for kids, okay? I'm just, I'm just telling that. Or gremlins. Who could forget that one? No, gremlins aren't real, are they? They are nightmarish in a lot of ways. Whatever's going on, the dynamic between humans and the animal world has changed. And notice this. Now, God adds something here in Genesis 9 that, that I think is fantastic. He now adds meat to our diet. Now, again, if you're a vegetarian, I love you. And I just sit there and go, more meat for me. And I am thankful that you're here. Uh, But but this is not a hill to die on. If you you choose certain dietary restrictions, um, what we need to understand is the Bible says what God has created is good. You eat. If you want to eat just plants, eat plants. If you want to eat meat, eat meat. But there are some people that make these things hills they're going to die on. But I want you to know how God says you are now allowed to eat meat. As one of those things that God says is going to change after the flood, because obviously since the flood, before the flood, it was obviously a plant-based diet. And I think there's some good evidence to support that. But now after the flood, he now allows us to eat meat. And so what he does say is he says, once you do eat meat, what you need to do is you need to respect life and, and, and eat what I've provided for you. Because the, the words of Paul ring true here in, in 1 Timothy. Write this passage down, 1 Timothy chapter 4. There's people who forbid marriage and require absence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving. There are people out there that want to tell you, you know, how to, how to eat and what to eat. And they'll tell you that it's a make or break issue when it comes to your relationship with God. But the Bible is clear that God says, I've given you all to enjoy, right? For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Amen? So, whatever you choose your diet to be, that is entirely between you and God and your conscience and the spirit. But no way are we to impose something on someone else's life that's not necessarily biblically true. I'm thankful that barbecue is introduced into Genesis chapter 9. Amen? You can actually write that down in your Bible like new barbecue, right? Here it is. Um... Animals are now free to eat, but we are to still respect animals because if you think about what's going on here is that there is another living creature that is giving its life for you to survive. And this is the point. And I'm guilty. You want to know how guilty I am? Because you guys know I love to eat. It is one of my spiritual gifts. If, if it's listed as a spiritual gift, uh, I take the word of Scripture seriously. Like, come let us worship and chow down. You guys know about that psalm? Uh, I love that psalm. Or where Paul says, I buffet my body. I'm like, amen. I buffet my body regularly. I love food. And uh, part of me, though, is I'm so uh, vociferous when it comes to my eating that I'm like, it's like, There's food flying. I'm so excited to eat, and I don't stop and go, 
thank you, Lord, for not only this meal, but perhaps based upon Genesis 9, we need to bring more thanksgiving and say, this cow that gave its life for me, thank you for creating it. Because I don't want to take any creature for granted that's allowing me to continue to survive. Amen? So maybe we need to get a little weird at our dinner tables and maybe when we were together with friends and really acknowledge and respect the life of the animals, even the plants that are also created by God, to say, God, thank you for these things. In no way are we to elevate animals on equal planes as humans. There's radical groups out there, one by the name of PETA. Do you want to hear how there is such a, 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 a horrible theology that's perpetuated out there among certain animal rights groups? And, and I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to get into this more in a moment. When we start valuing the life of an animal over the life of a human, you know this is a train wreck that's going to happen. The fact that someone's more concerned about the bald eagle than they are about the unborn baby growing inside their womb and that they're ready to abort. Amen? Here's what, these are their words. I'm going to read these things verbatim for you. So Ingrid Newkirk of PETA said, and these are her words, we humans have grown like a cancer. We're the biggest blight on the face of the earth. Uh, she says, the smallest form of life, even an ant or a clam, is equal to a human being. When it comes to feelings, a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. They're all mammals. They all feel pain. There is no rational basis that's saying that a human being has special rights. Now listen to this. Six million Jews died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die this year in slaughterhouses. And yet, this is a mentality that is perpetrated among groups like this. Uh, all this is based on the idea that animals are maybe not only equal to people, but perhaps even more important and have more rights than us. Listen to what uh, Michael Fox of the Humane Society says. We're not superior. There are no clear distinctions between us and animals. The life of an ant and the life of my child should be considered uh, equal consideration. You, you want to talk about why this thing is spiraling out of control? Listen to this. We're not done yet. A guy named Tom Regan, who's a philosophy professor, was asked what he would save, a dog or a baby, if a boat capsized in the ocean. He replied, if it were a retarded baby and a bright dog, I'd save the dog. It gets better. Pete Singer, who is a uh, very distinguished professor and writer, uh, knows that the Bible distinguishes between animals and people, and he knows this and he hates this, and this is why he says this, Pete Singer, Christianity is our foe. If animal rights is to succeed, we must destroy the Judeo-Christian religious tradition. It can no longer be maintained by anyone but a religious fanatic that man is the darling of the whole universe or that other animals were created to provide us with food or that we have divine authority over them and divine permission to mill them. Ladies and gentlemen, again, what does the Bible say? Number one, we have dominion over the animal world. And number two, man now has food from the animal world. There is no way to see it differently. And no way am I imposing a diet upon you, but I am saying what the God does now permit is that he says, I am giving you meat to eat. But keep this in mind, the life of these animals is to be respected. And number two, the blood of these animals must be treated as sacred. That's why the writer continues in Genesis 9. If you look at it, look at verse 4. You shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood still present. And what is remarkable is how God now sets up this new introduction into the diet of humans, but he says there's going to be a future that is going to use the blood for religious purposes. Remember, this is before Abraham. This is before Moses. And the sacrificial system that God would only ultimately set up for Israel, because this is pre-Israel. This has to do with humanity in general. God says, you need to understand how sacred the blood is. 
And when you even approach these animals, you respect their life and you make sure that the blood is set aside because you will ultimately use the blood for your religious ceremony. And how true is that? Because it points to even a greater reality of the blood that was spilled for us from the Lamb of God, i.e. Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Genesis 9 is pretty clear. Paul testifies to the reality of this in 1 Timothy chapter 4. So now animal life is proper food for man. It's designed that every meal now reminds us that life was made possible only by the death of another creature. And can I encourage us? Let us approach our meals. Eating is such an important thing in every culture and every place of the world. But perhaps we approach our meals differently. Perhaps we consider the eating and drinking to the glory of God that's found in the Bible, and we take it a little bit more seriously, that we're more thankful, that we're more appreciative of the salad that's there and the big ribeye that's there. And we say, thank you, God, because we are alive only because others have died for our sustenance. And if not only the animals, then at least the plants, because eating is a good thing and you're to celebrate it. Amen? Who's hungry now? You gotta wait, all right? Point number three, the protection of life. This is where we're gonna spend the, the rest of our time. Verses five and six. Because here is where he shifts gears and reminds us of how important human life is. Because we've just talked about animal life and how we are free to eat animals and respect the life of the animal and, and, and make sure we don't eat the meat with the blood still intact. Then he talks about humanity and blood, and he specifically talks about bloodshed. And this is, again, a context having to do with the violence that has been experienced on earth before the flood. And now God sets up a different form of human government. And this is an important thing to discuss, and this is important for us as a church to understand, that God celebrates the protection of life. And yet, what he seems to be calling for, though, is that we ought to be swift to execute any other human being that doesn't respect the life that is given. Now, the question is, how do we celebrate life and and respect life And yet, perhaps, take God's words to heart where he obviously is prescribing capital punishment or the death penalty. Because in our minds, we sit there and go, well, am I called to be a person of justice or am I called to be a person of mercy? And we think the two are antithetical. Can I tell you right now? Write down Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Here's what God says to the prophet Micah. Who is writing to a people that do not respect or value human life. He says these words, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness. It's not or. Go ahead, justice people over here and merciful people over here. He says these two themes can coexist. That we can respect life and and preach a message where we say it is not good to murder somebody. But on the other hand, if murder does happen and it is a premeditated action where a, a human being takes another human being out, that we are allowed to execute justice and execute that criminal. And there is both justice and mercy in that act. But in it all, what does it say? but you're to walk humbly with your God. We are to understand how powerful justice is. We are to understand how powerful mercy is. But in it all, as these things are joined together throughout Scripture, we are to walk humbly with our God, not take our authority for granted, not to take our power for granted. What does he say in Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6? Surely I will demand this. God seems pretty steadfast on what he wants. I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require it from every man, from every man's brother. I will require the life of man. So there's the demand in verse 5. And then it says in verse 6, what do you do? Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. A life for a life. This is called the law of retaliation. 
or if you want to go all Latin, who studied Latin when they were younger? Lex talionis. Num- uh, Exodus chapter 21. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a... I hate the dentist, but I'm sorry I had to go there with you guys. So, justice and kindness, or justice and mercy. Was this not evident on the cross of Christ? Because who was Jesus crucified with? Two thieves. One thief was open to the claims of Christ. He himself acknowledged that he deserved to die. But here he is in the presence of the Son of God. And he receives mercy, but he's still executed. It wasn't like Jesus said, hey, this person's now accepted me. Can you get him off the cross? Because now his life's changed. There was still a submission to government to execute, even though that, that thief experienced both justice and mercy in that singular event. Would you not agree with that? And so it's interesting when you think about even that scene on the cross. So what are we to make of all this? What are we to make of, of government? Because as St. Augustine said, one of the greatest minds ever in our world, he said this, government is a necessary evil. Why is it necessary? Because of the evil that exists. Let me explain this a little bit more. Even Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, disagreed a bit with Augustine, but both of them agreed that government was to do two things exercise restraint on human evil, but also to preserve the very possibility of human existence. This is why government exists. The first task of government is to protect people from evil and to make sure in the protection of evil, they preserve and maintain human life. And yet, part of the role of government is to show our respect for human life that if someone was to murder somebody else, with premeditation, they would give their own life as punishment for the life that they took. Romans chapter 12. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. I'm going to have it on the screen. This is important to understand in light of what Paul says in Romans. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it says, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. So, we're going to talk about this because when you lose a family member, to someone's premeditated, cold, calculated murder. It is, I, I've never been there, but I can only imagine the emotions that are stoked. Family, friends, someone loses their life at the hands of some cold-hearted murderer. There's a reason why Paul's writing this, because this comes at the end of chapter 12. He says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will keep burning coals on his head. This is mercy. When you lose someone to murder, you show that person mercy because that is your role as a citizen of heaven, a follower of Christ, because you are not government. But now what is government's role? Notice now what Paul says. Do not be overcome evil, uh, overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Then look what he says here in this next passage. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. The governing authorities are to be a terror to bad conduct. Uh, would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good. Drive the speed limit, Scott Morgan, right? And you will receive his approval for he, who is he? The government is God's servant for your good. The government is a minister. It is a pastor sent by God to do something that God has instituted them to do. But if you do wrong, what? Be afraid. Be very afraid. Right? For he does not bear the sword in vain. Bearing the sword, well, what is the sword? In Paul's day, it was an instrument for execution. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Who does the avenging? The government only at the sovereign placement of God of that government to whatever culture they are placed in. 
Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So notice there are several things are happening. For because of this, you also pay taxes. Who likes to pay taxes? No one does. But yet it is a legal force in place that we are called to do it. We may not like it, but we submit to it. Pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Wow. That is Civics 101. And this is foundational to the human government as given to us by God. What are we to make of all this? Well, before you take Paul's words, look at what Peter says in a much more abbreviated fashion. 1 Peter chapter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake to how many human institutions? Every. Don't you hate saying that? Because we're looking for an excuse not to be submissive to certain governments. But it says every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as set by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So notice the words that Peter uses are very, very similar to where the words Paul uses. What does government do? Two things. Write these down in your notes. Number one, government is given to us to uh, reward good, and government is given to us to punish evil. Paul is writing under a corrupt government. Paul is writing under the Roman rule. Paul didn't like what the Romans were doing. Jesus even had disagreements with what the government was doing, but both Jesus, Paul, Peter, submit to government. Even Jesus, when it came to paying taxes, I know some people are like, oh, I'm not going to pay taxes because I don't like what the government's u- using my tax money for. That's not what God says. Jesus says, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. He didn't say, but there is a clause only when they support your causes. No, you do it. Because your allegiance is to a greater citizenship. You are to live as a morally upstanding citizen who says they know Jesus. Live that way. Be a peaceable person. You may not like, you may not agree, but there's still a submission that happens from you before your government. And how you submit to government reveals a lot how you submit to the Lordship of Christ. Can can, can I say that one more time? Your submission to government, whether you like it or not, ultimately shows the level of submission you have in a greater Lord, a greater emperor, a greater king, Jesus. And my submission to Christ ought to be clear even when I may disagree with civil authorities. So the purpose of government, the responsibility of government is to protect, maintain, support human life. And any government that sanctioned the destruction of innocent life has failed in its divine mandate to govern. I love what R.C. Sproul said. He says this, to protect human life from the destructive impulses of other human beings, that's the role of government. Can you write down two words for me, if you would? Abortion and euthanasia. And euthanasia is not spelled youth in Asia. That's not, uh, hooked on phonics worked for me, but these are two. How a government, how a society values the unborn and the elderly will tell you about how long that government, that civilization is going to survive. There is no civilization that has ever lasted that killed the innocent children and killed the elderly and has lived to tell about it. What does that mean for America? I don't know. I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet. But I'm only going to tell you right now that God puts a premium value on the life of the unborn. I'm going to tell you right now that if government is doing its job, it, per- it protects those who are weak and cannot defend themselves. What greater group is that than the unborn? And I'm not going to say that abortion is the unforgivable sin. It's the unpardonable sin. I know that there are women and I know there, there are men who have journeyed down this road and have made decisions that perhaps they are, they are, they are they're feeling guilty for and shame for and I want you to know that if, if anyone has ever experienced this in this room you are not beyond the forgiveness of God you need to hear that but moving forward as a church community we need to understand the value of 
the unborn life. We need to espouse the sanctity of human life. And that's why we sit there and go, if government is doing its job, it would do something about the 1.6 million abortions that take place every year. Because there's no greater group that is weak and defenseless like the unborn. And so to terminate the life of the unborn is to take the life of a living person. Euthanasia as well. That we believe that life is sacred. And the Bible says this, our times, our length of life is in God's hands. He determines when you exit this world. What we need to understand is that we have this theology that we are not to go through pain. And I don't know who taught you this. Probably mommy and daddy that oh, I never want to bring pain upon my child. No, you bring pain to teach lessons. There's a reason why God allows us. We believe that Jesus brings a theology of non-pain. You are wrong. And perhaps it is our pain, it is our diseases, it is our illnesses that teach us more about what it means to be a disciple of Christ than any of the comforts and luxuries we surround ourselves with. Amen? We need to understand when it comes to ending life, it is God that determines that. Hence the differentiation between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia is when you deliberately take the life of somebody by injecting some sort of poison in their IV or taking a gun to their head uh, if they just want to be pain-free from the cancer or whatever disease. That's active. That is clearly unbiblical and against the, the will of God. Passive euthanasia is when you allow the natural course of events to take their place. We need to understand that I'm not saying that life should be actively continued by artificial means when there's no reasonable hope of life being restored because it may become, there may come a time when a person has to be allowed to die. And we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is that we make sure that the sick baby or the elderly patient, there comes a point where the natural courses of things need to take place. And that's up to God's timing. And, you know, we, we don't want to see people go through pain and we don't want to see people suffer. But who are we to say that God doesn't use those moments of pain and suffering to bring him glory and continue to expand the gospel of Jesus Christ? I know. Welcome to church. And these are not fun things to talk about. But we live in a society that brings great disregard to humanity because they support abortion and they support active euthanasia. First thing we need to understand is this. There's a cosmic authority. And I probably went out of order, and I'm sorry. Some of you are like, I don't even know where we're at on the outline. There's cosmic authority, and there's earthly authority. Again, the reminder of this as believers in Christ, we have a God who is large and in charge. We have a God who is sovereignly in control of the universe, and he is the one, according to Daniel, chapter 2, chapter 4, that allows kings to rise and kings to fall. He's the one that allows kingdoms to rise and kingdoms to fall. And it was even Jesus who stood before Pilate in John 19 and says to Pilate, and I would have loved to have been there at this moment, he says, you would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you first from above. Boom, right? Like, so Jesus submitting to government. Did Jesus deserve to die? No, but he's still standing there awaiting execution and yet brings to remembrance, brings to a reminder, brings to even maybe a point of first realization, Pilate, you're only here. You may think you are powerful. You may think you have ultimate authority. You would not even be here without my father first allowing it to happen. See, Paul in Romans reminds us of this. Government is God's servant for our good. Every government is, is, is given to us by God. It's not saying every government's good. It's not saying every government does what is right. But we need to understand that the government is given as God's agent for what? Carrying out God's wrath on the wrongdoer, rewarding good but punishing evil. 
And so the institution of civil government is something that is good, a benefit that flows from God's infinite wisdom and love and care for his creation. But what we have to do battle with and what we have to wrestle with is earthly, earthly authority. And can I tell you right now, guys, and I just want to be just honest, I'm not, I'm not up here to take political sides, and I'm not here to talk about specific laws and this and that, only to say that it is, it is interesting that the first thing that God says to us is that there is government given by God to us for our good, and it is to punish evil, specifically bring about capital punishment. Now, we as the church, we have mistakenly over the centuries confused the power of the cross with the power of the sword as being our responsibility. It is not the church's responsibility to execute the power of the sword. It is the church's responsibility to execute the power of the cross. It is the government's responsibility to execute the power of the sword. That means Christians are to be model citizens even when we disagree with government. Does anyone have a disagreement with government right now? Yes! But the power of the sword represents the right of the state to use force to make its citizens comply when we don't want to comply. I am forced to pay taxes. I am forced to obey the speed limit. We like this. We need this. If not, there's total anarchy. And so we have this first set up with us in the, in the garden. Remember what was set up when Adam and Eve sinned, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. And what did he set up to guard the entrance to the garden so that they would not go back in? An angel with a sword. So now you have this sword very present in the very beginning of creation after Adam and Eve rebel. Things are going to be different. And now God puts a flaming messenger, an angel to guard with a sword saying there is now some place that is off limits. And if you even dare try to cross it, you will be executed. And so what is the church's authority? What is the church's responsibility? It is purely spiritual. Can you, can you write down three, three things for me? And, I, and I'm going to circle back to this at the very end of the message. Your responsibility, exercising the power of the cross, is this. Yours is the power of the word. Yours is the power of service. And yours is the power of imitating Jesus. That's it. Don't, don't complicate it. Don't try to go out there and exercise the power of the sword because that is not given to you unless you're in a government role. And if there's any law enforcement, if there's any firefighters, if there's any elected politicians, thank you for your service. We're glad you're there. But what does the church do? Because the majority of us in this room right now are not exercising the power of the sword. We are exercising the power of the spirit. You are dependent upon the word of God. You serve like the way Christ serves, and you imitate Jesus as best as possible. That is the sphere of your influence. That is the sphere of your authority. Remember Jesus with Pilate, right? Reminding him of the fact that his authority is given to him only by God, and Jesus was going to be submissive to a greater authority. That's why Peter says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And you do it as best as you can with an eye to glorifying Christ. And there is a place for civil disobedience. And here's where the line is drawn. We are obedient to human institutions. And we are to do what they ask us. Unless government commands you to do something God forbids. Or forbids you from doing something God commands. Not only do you, you must disobey at those moments. Acts chapter 4, the disciples are telling everyone about Jesus, and the civil authorities arrest them, they beat them, and then when the disciples are set free, it says they went about from being beaten and in prison, singing and, and being joyous, which is crazy, right? And they said, oh yeah, make sure you guys don't tell anyone about Jesus ever again. They're like, right, see you next week, right? Like, save, save my cot, I'm, I'm going to be back for that yummy hummus you guys serve in the prison, right? Um, if that's what they ate, I don't know. Um, but the writing in, in Acts chapter four says, when it comes to civil dis disobedience, we obey God more than we obey government. Government tells you to stop talking about Jesus. Well, guess what? You're called to talk about Jesus. And that's where you must 
disobey. But they, could, they said, you stop praying? No. Uh-uh. You stop worshiping? Uh-uh. You stop carrying around Bibles? Uh-uh. There are some societies right now where those things are illegal. And people are giving their lives. Why? Because they'd rather obey God than government. So when those authorities command us to do something God forbids or forbids us from doing something God commands, we must obey God rather than earthly authorities. Amen? So look how God speaks to earthly uh, rulers. Psalm 82. And again, this, I want to try to show you this full perspective from scriptures look at psalm 82 how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked this is god speaking to earthly governors rulers give justice to the weak and to the fatherless maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute rescue the weak and the needy deliver them from the hand of the wicked you see how this theme is just just so constant throughout scripture four things we need to talk about and we'll close with these not only does god gives government to reward good he gives us government to punish evil Four words beginning with the word letter R. Respect, restraining, reckoning, and retribution. First is this. What God wants us to understand is that there's a respect for God's image. Every human life is sacred. Every human life is God's property. Every human life bears the image of God. It is stamped with, this is my property. I have a library in my house. Literally a library. I've got thousands of books. If you've ever been to my house, I've got a book library downstairs. I've got a library upstairs. I eventually want to build a huge library on my wall with one of those cool rolling ladders. My wife won't permit it, and she is the boss, so... But I have a stamp. If you ever borrow a book from me, there's a stamp that on the bottom says the property of Scott Morgan. Actually, no, it says from the library of Scott Morgan. Why? Because that stamp tells you who that book belongs to. Now, have I lost hundreds of books throughout the years because people haven't returned them, even though it says where it's from? But it still belongs to me, right? This is the thing with humanity. Every life bears the stamp that you are God's property. You belong to God. And so with that, there should be respect given. And we live in a culture, you guys, where you just read the news. Whether it be school shootings, whether it be uh, the topic of abortion, whether it be just any example or illustration of the dehumanization of human life. Officer-involved shootings. Phoenix alone. 35 to date this year. Three this past week. This is not how we treat those in authority. We extend respect to every single person created in the image of God. And so we need to understand this is where God stands. That He is going to change things now because of the wickedness on the earth that there is now a a greater understanding respect. And if that means bringing about capital punishment so that there's a heightened respect for humanity, then that's what it's going to be. Number two, restraining evil hearts. Can we just be honest? The, the, The evil heart is human. I mean, the heart of the human is evil. That was all backwards, wasn't it? Every human heart is evil. And the fear of punishment can help to restrain would-be lawbreakers. But let me remind you, the law, write this down. The law can restrain, but the law cannot regenerate. Don't we expect the law to do the work of regeneration when we need to realize that only God can do the work of regeneration? Can go ahead, someone go ahead and tweet that out right now? The law can restrain, but it can't regenerate. And so the law is a good thing because it restrains lawbreaking that exists within every one of us. You are lawbreakers. I am a lawbreaker. Hence my time with the highway patrol two days ago. But government should be not only enforcing laws to restrain evil, they need to be swift in punishment to deter crimes from happening. The reason perhaps there's been 
this, this increase in school shootings and abortions and officer-involved uh, casualties is the fact that government is not swift. They're playing games with human lives. And even Ecclesiastes, the wisest man in all the world in chapter 8, says these words. Listen to this. 3,000 years ago. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. Because we have men and women who in premeditated, cold-hearted action of murder are sitting in prison, they're being incarcerated, when in reality the government should be putting those people to death, not only to deter future cases of murder, but to also establish the fact that every single human being is to be respected because they bear the mark of God's image. Romans 13.3, government is sent to be a terror to bad conduct. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of terror when someone chooses to shoot another human being. There's not a lot of terror there. Why? Because the government is refusing to do swiftly what it needs to do and then is execute the cold-blooded murderer. Reckoning of a payment required. A premeditated attack on another human being is an attack on God. Because every human being bears the mark that they are God's property and they're created in the image of God. So you attack another person, the mentality is this, you attack God. How do you, how do you even cultivate in a, that in a culture that just doesn't even want to talk about God? Doesn't even want to acknowledge God? We suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans chapter 1 says. It starts with the church reminding those in civil positions of authority. We are created creatures made by a creator with this instinct, intrinsic dignity and worth. There is respect, and we will be the ones out there letting our government officials know, yes, the unborn lives are to be protected, the elderly are to be loved and respected, and everything in between is to be extolled on a level that is different than the animal world. Amen? We are to be the ones to say that life is given to us by God, and we need to be more like Him in our lives. And this is what the church does when exercising the sword, not the sword, but the, the, the cross. We let people know that we are created in God's image and there's an accountability. And when that line is crossed, there is a payment that is required. And what does God say? You pay life for a life. Remember Abel and Cain? It's interesting that God didn't take out Cain after he murdered Abel. But what does God say? He says, I hear Abel's blood cry out from the ground. Why? Because even the blood of Abel cried for some sort of justice to be done. Well, here is the realization and the fruition of that. The repayment is the forfeiture of the criminal's own life. Lex talionis. Back to Jesus. Remember when Peter took out the sword that night he was to be risked? And what did Peter do? He wasn't a good swordsman. He just lopped off Malchus's ear. Right? And Jesus is like, can you imagine him grabbing the, like, the ear and being like, all right, here we go. Heal it. Like, Peter, what does he say to Peter? He says this. For those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Jesus affirms capital punishment. Jesus is saying if you take a man's life, you have to give your life in exchange for it. As repayment. You can't use that sword to kill somebody with impunity. You take his life, and they have a right to take your life. The Apostle Paul, he said in Acts chapter 25 that if I am a wrongdoer of anything according to the Roman courts, guess what? Then I am worthy of death, and I will submit to that. He didn't fight, but he made his presence in those situations known that he was a citizen of a greater country. And ultimately, Paul would die at the hands of the Roman officials. He would be beheaded for his faith. Now what about the question of what if something accidentally happens? If it's not premeditated murder, it's called manslaughter. Listen to this. The Bible sets up a 
another form of government where if someone accidentally dies at your hands, the Bible in Numbers chapter 35 and Deuteronomy chapter 19 says, there will be six cities of refuge on both sides of the Jordan, three on the west side, three on the east side. And if something happens and the family of someone you killed wants your neck and it was an accident, you run to one of these six cities of refuge and you will let the leaders of that town know and they will deliberate and come down with a verdict. So it's interesting that God, even in his infinitesimal wisdom, says there's going to be occasions when something happens by accident. And the family of someone that loses a loved one doesn't care if it's an accident or not. They're hurt. But they are not to act with vengeance or try to avenge the blood of their loved one. You run to the city of refuge because God says we need to also exercise judgment with some wisdom. You let the leadership determine what's going on. And if it's found that that person's guilty, then they will be executed. But if not, they shall stay in asylum and have a refuge to remain the rest of their lives. And the family has to accept that. Which brings us to our last point, retribution. But in the meantime, it is this government that bears the sword. Why? Because in your discussion before the message, you talked about order is better than chaos. Amen? Order is better than anarchy. There's a reason why we have laws and we have government and God says this is why capital punishment is important. God will bring about retribution, but it will be specifically through his agent of retribution called the government. So the purpose of civil punishment is not only to prevent further wrongdoing, but to carry out God's wrath against the wrongdoer. How do we close this all up? Where do we go from here? It's interesting that we have this in Genesis, right? I I would rather talk about the world and how beautiful it is. And all of God, you know, the puppy dogs and the kittens and all that God's created. and, And yet we have this place in Scripture that we ought to be knowledgeable of. Here's what you do. Pray for your government. Amen? Pray for your government. Number two, you pray for your elected officials. You pray for those elected officials, everyone from the president to Congress to your state and local officials. You pray for them. And you you even get a voice. You even get a chance to maybe send them an email or talk to them. I had actually hit someone this past week from the city of Chandler here at Sozo Coffee. We were talking, shaking hands. You know what? I may not agree with them, but I respect them because of their position, because God put them in that position. And I do my job to to let my voice be heard. I let people know that, you know what, no, abortion is not right, so I'm not going to vote for any candidate that supports abortion. Amen? I'm not not for other things. So, you know what, I let, but I do it with respect and gentleness. And then in the meantime, while I don't carry the sword, what I do have is the cross. And that is what we lead by, ladies and gentlemen, because your citizenship is not of this world. It is a heavenly citizenship awaiting your arrival, remember that this world will pass away, but your life with Christ is eternal. Amen? What gives us hope now? Jesus. What what boosts our spirit and builds our morale? It is Christ. It is us living in a manner that is reflected upon him and his great work that ultimately this world will perish, but the kingdom of heaven will last forever. So live as model citizens, reflecting the spirit of Christ. And you know what? You will be rewarded by your heavenly father. Amen. That's how we buckle this thing up. Amen. Good stuff. All right. Do you have any disagreements? Don't talk to me. But if you agree with me, just go ahead and show me all the love you guys want. All right. So stand up. Let's pray. In all seriousness, we preach Christ and him crucified. There's room for disagreements in the church of Christ. You may not agree with me on my position of being carnivores. You may not agree with me on my position of capital punishment. But here's what I do invite. Dialogue. I invite conversation. We live in a culture where the moment someone disagrees with you, we just disown them. 
the platform of, for civil discourse needs to be reinstated because the importance of having respectful and healthy dialogue is what made our country so wonderful to begin with. We can disagree with each other without being disagreeable. And we can love each other with the love of Christ, whether we agree on all things or you differ on all things. Amen? Let's, let's model that for our world. Father, thank you for this morning. <sighs> Heavy topics. Lord, you, sometimes your word presents us with stuff that, honestly, as, as, as a pastor of this church, I would love to skip over. And yet, it's right there, front and center. And, and I believe you want us to understand how important it is. So I pray that somehow, through the words I have put together, your spirit would do a greater work. Instill within us the, the truth of your word, the importance of your word, why these things are so important to our culture and our government, Lord. And Lord, in the meantime, with the things we can't control, we pray and we leave them in your hands, but the things we can control, meaning our lives and how we present ourselves in our culture, my prayer is that we as your people would imitate Christ and that would be our sole desire. Let us love, let us give, and let us perhaps even sacrifice when needed for the glory of you and the cause of Christ. Thank you for this time today, for calling us to be your people and for giving us a citizenship in heaven that can never, ever be taken away from us. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. And apologize to the crowd outside that's waiting to come in, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.